World War II brought about some amazing advancements in military technology, but for every effective new weapon, there were bound to be a few duds. Here are six of the weirdest and worst weapons of World War II. The Americans were known for their naval might with their reliance on massive aircraft carriers, powerful battleships and speedy cruisers. One naval weapon that was anything but mighty however was the Mark 14 torpedo. The Mark 14 was developed in the 1930s to replace the World War I era Mark 10 torpedo. At a cost of nearly 10 grand a piece, the Mark 14 was never live fire tested as the Navy couldn't afford to do so and it cost them dearly. The Mark 14 was overcome with issues the moment it hit the water. First, a lack of depth control meant that the Mark 14s routinely ran about 3 meters deeper than intended, often missing their targets completely. Additionally, Mark 14s were equipped with magnetic influence exploders to detect their target, but the inaccuracy of these devices caused an estimated 10% to detonate prematurely and many torpedoes that did make contact with their targets never exploded at all because of fragile firing pins, which often bent due to the speed of the torpedo. The Mark 14's worst issue though was its tendency to circle back due to problems with its gyro angle. This meant American submarines sometimes had to dodge their own torpedoes. While it's never been confirmed, the Mark 14 was likely what sank the USS Gurion and USS Tullaby. It was only after these incidents that the Navy finally re-evaluated and fixed the Mark 14, which went on to be a much more reliable weapon after the war. Before the Allied landings at Normandy, the British were searching for ways to get through the Atlantic Wall, the coastal defenses and barriers erected by the Axis. The Admiralty's Directorate of Miscellaneous Weapon Development was tasked with developing a weapon that could be launched from Allied landing crafts and would easily penetrate the wall. Their solution? the Great Panjandrum. Resembling a large spool, the Great Panjandrum was a steel-filled drum with explosives suspended between two wooden wheels. Cordite rockets attached to each wheel would propel the device forward, allowing it to reach speeds of around 100 km per hour and creating enough momentum to blow a hole in the wall. While the design may have sounded good in theory, the testing of the weapon proved disastrous at every turn. The first iteration veered off course after several rockets failed. Testing the second iteration, many of the rockets detached, sending spectators flying for cover. The third iteration employed cables as a steering mechanism, but the cables quickly snapped, causing an additional hazard. Despite these issues, the researchers persevered. At the final demonstration, however, the Panjandrum swerved wildly off course, straight toward a line of high-ranking generals watching from a distance. After it almost plowed through the generals, the project was scrapped and the Great Panjandrum never saw battle. Germany was infamous for producing strange and experimental weapons during the war. None exemplified this more than the Krumlauf. German for curved barrel, this aptly named barrel attachment was designed to guide bullets around corners with the aid of a periscope. Development began in 1943 and four varieties were ultimately made a 30 degree version for infantry and a 90 degree one for tank mounted use, though only the 30 degree version was ever mass produced. Krumlauf barrel attachments were designed to fit the Sturmgewehr rifle, an otherwise standard assault rifle. Unfortunately, the attachment made the rifles too impractical for the battlefield. A neat idea in theory, but physics ensured that the life of this barrel was short. Because of the pressure applied to the curved barrel each time a round was fired through it, the barrels could only endure 160 to 300 rounds. Additionally, the curve would cause bullets to shatter inside the barrel, spitting the fragments out like shotgun pellets. The designers tried to fix this by adding venting holes to the barrel with little success. This meant that, as a rifle, it proved very ineffective as it couldn't be fired from any meaningful distance. Even so, the idea of a curved barrel fascinated other military powers, and both the Soviets and the Americans tried to replicate it with similar results. Another brainchild of German engineers was the V-2 rocket, the world's first ballistic missile. Otherwise known as the Vengeance Weapon 2, it was designed by a team led by Werner von Braun, a German scientist who would go on to be a rocket pioneer at NASA. 
The V2 was incredible in all technical aspects. 14 meters long and weighing between 12,700 and 13,200 kilograms, the V2 became the first rocket to reach space in June 1944 when it rose to an altitude of 175 kilometers. Traveling at supersonic speed without an audible warning, these rockets seemed promising to the Germans who were increasingly desperate for a wonder weapon as the war dragged on. In September 1944, over 3,000 V2s were launched against Allied troops in Britain, Belgium and France. Overall, the attacks killed around 9,000 civilians and military personnel at an average of less than 3 deaths per rocket launched. This was by no means effective as the cost to create a V2 rocket was astronomical, especially for an already struggling economy. Though the exact cost is unknown, some sources claim it was around 500 million US dollars in 1940. As historian Steven Zaloga notes, the entire seven month V2 missile campaign delivered less high explosive on all the targeted cities than a single large RAF raid on Germany. While the V2 was an impressive technological feat that would go on to revolutionize rocketry and space travel, pouring the time and money into building it proved a bad military decision for the Germans. While the Germans were developing ballistic missiles, the Japanese were toying around with another long-range weapon, the Fugo balloon. The Fugo was conceived in the late 1930s but not introduced until 1942 as a retaliatory measure after the American raid on Tokyo. The Fulgo was a low-tech solution to long-range weaponry. After months of design, the Imperial Japanese Army's Number 9 Research Laboratory prototyped a balloon 6 meters in length that could fly at 7,600 meters for about 30 hours. Constructed with 5 layers of washi paper glued together with potato paste, these balloons were strapped with 5 kilogram timed incendiary devices that would detonate at the end of their flight. The balloons were specially designed to be launched from Japan and reach the continental US using the jet stream currents. Over the course of several months, the Japanese launched 9,300 Fugo balloons toward the US with only 300 reaching land. However, issues with detonators meant that many of these never exploded and those that did caused no real damage or loss of life. The only exception was on the 5th of May 1945 when one balloon killed six civilians, a woman and five children, after they found it in a national forest and disturbed it, causing it to detonate. These were the only fatalities in the continental US during the entire war. In 1945, the Japanese abandoned the project, accepting it as a massive failure. Perhaps the most controversial of all the worst weapons were the Soviets' anti-tank dogs. The program began in the 1930s with the Red Army devising ways for canines to deliver live explosives to enemy tanks. But when the dogs failed to leave the bombs correctly, the Soviets conceived a simpler, crueler tactic. Strap bombs to the dogs to detonate on impact with the tanks. The Soviets trained German shepherds by placing food under tanks. The dogs were strapped with 10 to 12 kilograms of explosives that would detonate as they crawled under the tanks. In training, they were remarkably accurate, and toward the end of 1941, the first group of dogs was deployed to the front. Once on the battlefield, several issues emerged. First, while the dogs were trained using Soviet diesel tanks, Germans used gasoline tanks, and the difference in scents confused the dogs. Additionally, the stressful atmosphere of the battlefield caused many dogs to run away or run back toward their handlers. Of the first 30 dogs, only four managed to detonate near tanks. Six turned back and exploded near their handlers, killing and injuring them. Others ran away or were shot before they could reach their targets. Plus, the Germans quickly realized the Soviets' plan and were instructed to shoot any dog on the battlefield as a precaution. Overall, the anti-tank dogs had some success on the battlefield, though the exact number of tanks they destroyed is unclear. The Soviets claimed upwards of 300, but many believe this number to be propaganda. After 1942, the program declined as dogs were deployed elsewhere for mine sniffing tasks. But the Soviets didn't fully abandon the program until 1996. The Japanese and the US also experimented with anti-tank dogs, though both without much luck. While some of the weapons we discussed in this video eventually went on to be successful or lead to revolutionary technology, 
During the war, they were costly, ineffective, and crude. But what do you think? Which one of these weapons was the absolute worst? Did we miss any? Let us know all that and more in the comments section below. And as always guys, thank you so much for watching, and I hope you learned something new.